The alternative title to our session is How to Build a Law School Website, or Four, for $80 in Chinese Food, which is what we did at UConn Law last summer. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our group. Um, we came together um, by authorization of a dean, or then an interim dean, and I'll address that in a minute. But let me start over here to my left. Don Babcock, who is our Web Program and Systems Administrator. Jessica DePiro-Whitman, who is our Head of IT, Information Technology Services. Karen DiMiola, our Assistant Dean of Students. I'm the Director of Communications for the Law School. And this is Bianca Sloda, who works with, my, with me in communications as our Multimedia Communications Specialist. Um, you might note that I put the, the list in alphabetical order. Um, because one of the underlying values of how we worked as a team was the idea that we all came together to the table and we all brought a unique set of skills to the project. And so although we had an assistant dean, a couple directors, a couple of folks um, all over the place in terms of what our roles are at the law school, when we came together we were a group of equals and we had a lot of conversation, we disagreed a lot, but um, yesterday I asked Bianca if at any point did any one of us pull rank and the right answer to me was yeah, was no, um, <laughs> because um, it's just the right answer. Um, but I don't think that that ever happened. Um, we all were down in the trenches. We all um, played our part, played our role, respected each other for the for the things that we brought to the table, which I think is very important. How we were successful in accomplishing this. So the big question is, um, our timeline was eight months. Seven months. Don says seven months. We'll go with Don. Seven months. Um, we launched in August of 2013. And anybody might ask, why in the world would you want to do that? Um, and there were two reasons why we had to do that. We were told to do that. Um, we were uh, put together by an interim dean, but we had a new dean coming in um, who joined us last July officially, but began being very active in the law school community in August, in um, April. And he came to us in July and said, I want this launched before school starts in August. So we had to compress our timeline. And a picture is worth a thousand words. That's what it looked like. And it, has, it had looked like that. Um, I joined the law school in September of 2004. So it looked like that from September of 2004 at least. I think it might have gone back further than that. Don, do you know? Different versions of that, but the theme had basically been the same for the better part of the day. Until last August 13th. So it was well overdue for some work. Um, from a communications and marketing perspective, you can see we were very limited in the amount of messaging that we could do in that space. Um, I was responsible for those four spots there um, and that news feed on the side, which basically was our faculty um, uh, uh, commenting in the news, and we would put information up. Um, when they were in the news. This um, particular slide shows a faculty page and we had things like this which were very um, comprehensive in terms of the commentary that was on the page and we had things like this. He is a professor. It didn't say much. We didn't have a lot of investment in terms of content development and so on and so forth. So let me give you a quick history lesson. Any communications people in the room? Excellent. One. One? I didn't look over here. One? So on a lot of the listservs that I participate in, there's an ongoing conversation about the divide between information technology services, whatever you call it at your school, and communications. And there's a huge uh, river between those two groups. And you can never actually cross the river to be able to work together. So my theory has always been, I can work on messaging, I can do content development, I can do a lot of things that have to do with building a profile and image of brand value for the school, but I can't put it on the website because I need some support from the folks in information technology. And the way we had been structured in the past, I, when I joined in September 2004, we didn't have a communications director back then. Um, we had little bits and pieces of things in different places, but there wasn't a formal communications office. And so at the time, our webmaster, um, had a lot of people coming at them all the time. And you see that group there. And you see the boxes above their head with comment boxes because everybody had an opinion. Everybody wanted something. Everybody wanted it now. If you were really loud, he helped you quicker. And he was really 
trying to manage a lot of things coming at him, but there was really no global oversight of the site as a marketing tool. So when I joined, I'm over here by myself. Bianca just joined me about two years ago. Um, and I was saying, wait, 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 you know, where are the, where's the messaging? Where's the, where's the information in terms of the audience? Well, who are we talking to? How is that happening? Because it was happening that people were coming at this webmaster all over the place, and there was really no comprehensive oversight of the site. And so as such, we ended up with the site that looked like what it did earlier. So I am now passing it to Jess. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me, or do I need to adjust the microphone? I'm good? All right. So everyone was in agreement. Communications wanted to put out a cohesive message. IT wanted to control the security as well as the access. Um, and campus leadership had um, basically told us, we want to change. And we want you to make the, be the website better. Make it pretty. And so we found ourselves asking a couple of questions. First off, what's the goal? Second, what do other schools do? Third, what's the timeline? Um, who are we going to piss off because someone's going to get mad? And uh, can we build a structure that we can reasonably um, sustain? And so we found out really quickly that we needed a lot of resources. Um, Don will go over um, in a little bit what we defined as what make it pretty would be. Um, but with that aside, we quickly set forth in trying to determine what other schools did. So it didn't take us very long to find out that you need lots of people. You need management. You need information architects. You need a web programmer, systems admin, a user interface um, administrator. You needed a graphic designer. You needed content developers. You needed a training specialist. And you needed people who were actually interested in making this work. On top of that, you also needed time. Um, is anybody here participated in a web uh, reconstruction project at their schools? OK, so you guys all know that it at least probably takes about 18 months for you to do it right, from soup to nuts. Um, and you also need a lot of money. And so it's not uncommon to spend you know, up to or over $100,000 just on getting a web frame um, and a wireframe and just to get a plan. So. What we actually had, as Michelle had referred to before, we had a Michelle, and there was some time. And then Bianca came along in 2012, and uh, I joined soon after that. Um, but by the time Donald joined us in January 2013, uh, we found out that we were running out of time. Uh, we also found out that, uh, well, we didn't find out, but we knew that our faculty and staff were used to and actually preferred the old site the way that it was. Um, they were able to find everything. They you know, had their bookmarks. They knew exactly where things were. They knew um, that they could post anything that they wanted at a moment's notice. And they didn't have to go through anybody. Because why? Why did you need to? It's a, it's a CMS. That's the purpose of a CMS, right? Um, and we also had a campus community that had a lot to say. Our original goal was to create a public site in about six months and a portal site in 12 months, given all of the constraints that we had. But little did we know that was all going to change. So we had to learn how to say no. So how do you say no? We had to do our research. So the first place where we started to do our research was on our very own branding site at the university. Um, our university communications department, they had this entire website on what the logos, the you know, branding procedures, um, everything from fonts to you know, style, style guides, whatever you would want is on this website. What was actually pretty cool about this website is that they had their own template generator. So all we had to say was what kind of logo we liked, what colors we liked, and poof, automatically it would pop up a, uh, a logo banner with a search bar and a footer that we could go and use. And everything else in between was fair game. We also used Google Analytics um, to get metrics on just random things. So for example, in this particular um, statistic, we found that lots of people went to our site, but they didn't stay there for long. And you know whether that's because we didn't really have much of a menu navigation or a hierarchy in terms of how the information was laid out, we couldn't really tell until we had to dig deeper. We later came to adopt Crazy Egg, which is a paid for tool. Um, it produces heat maps, basically, um, of where you uh, visit on particular websites. Um, and it's not that expensive. It's actually been a pretty good tool. We've used it, and we continue to use it. 
for all our projects going forward. Um, so I don't know if you can tell, but everything that I've mentioned so far is free or low cost. Um, and so we're a public university, and we are a law school that had no money to devote to this project. And so one thing that we're really proud of is that we were able to use student labor um, creatively in order to get the information that we needed. So we had about 14 help desk students at the IT department. And basically what I told them to do is, I want you to go and scour the top 50 law schools in the country. Scour their websites. I want you to tell me what does their menu look like? What are their menu topics? I want you to tell me, do they have submenus? Do they use a drop down menu? What is the order of all of the different uh, menu titles that you have in your particular website? Um, we asked them to look at the structure of each school's homepage and see if there were any common themes. Um, we also asked what items were above the fold and below the fold. Um, and we also noted if schools used subfooters. Um, as we went through the top 50 law schools' websites in the country, we also um, noted whether or not they used Drupal. And you know, for us, it was mostly a guess. I think that uh, we do our fair share of networking uh, with other law schools uh, in the country, and so just by talking to you know our friends, we would go and just ask them, "Do you use Drupal?" And if they did, that was great because then we would know that we could implement it into our own site as well. So we kept all these notes in Google Drive, which was offered um, for free um, as part of our main university's Google Apps for Education suite. And after much back and forth, working behind closed doors, becoming best friends with post-its and dry erase markers, um, and learning an open source learning um, open source source software suite called Pencil, uh, we came up with this draft. Um, and so you may ask, why were those reports so important? We spent a great number of weeks developing these reports. And so one of the main ways that we use this report is when we got feedback back from our users and they would say, I don't like that menu. Why don't you have it in alphabetical order? Because that doesn't make sense. You know, you should treat everybody equally. And what we were able to go and prove is that with all of the other schools that we had gone and surveyed, we actually found that the admissions button was at the top left hand corner. And if our goal is to attract prospective students, then we should be able to make sure that they can get to this information easily. And if they saw from the other 49 or 50 websites that the admissions button was in the top left-hand corner, then it would be easy for them to find our admissions information in that location as well. And so we use statistics like that to um, basically justify all of the reasons why we built our site the way that we did. And so, while the IT department was building this, and that's just the second half below the fold, we had gone to Michelle and Bianca and we had said, so what do you guys think? And I think the first reaction from you was, oh my gosh, there's a lot of content, much more than the four um, pockets of information that we were citing to before. Um, and even though we could come up with a structure and um, communications could come up with a cohesive theme and message, we couldn't really speak to what everybody did on a regular basis. But we still thought we had good designs in place. Um, so we started pitching the home page to a wide variety of users. We actually had um, five student groups, three staff groups, and two faculty groups um, that we all did usability studies on. Um, and despite our efforts, we got, we got that. So, you know, it says like, I like the design, it's great. Can you make it pop? <coughs> Can you make it pop a lot? We want more flash, we want more pizzazz. And the only way that we could develop that is if we had really rich um, content. And there's only four, five of us with Karen, and um, we knew that we had to call upon the faculty and staff to generate content. So for each section of the website, um, we designed um, a structure where uh, each section of the website would have a content head. So for admissions, it would be the director of admissions, would be our content head. Uh, for academics, it would be our associate dean for academic affairs. Um, for the library, it was the associate dean for library and technology, as well as the director for library services. For faculty, it was our associate dean for research and development. Um, student life and resources was Karen, our assistant dean for student services. Um, our alumni was director of external relations, and the about section was the director of communications. So you may also notice that I didn't mention any names. Um, and that's because the content head title follows with the position. So if anyone were to retire or were to 
um, take leave or what have you, no longer fill that position, then the next person in that position would automatically take the content head role. Each content head would be responsible not only for generating their own content, but they would also help identify others within the law school that would generate the content for us. Um, as we said, we don't know what they did on an everyday basis. Um, and we had lots of content spots to fill up and we needed people's help. So for example, under academics, we would work with the registrar to generate content about course offerings, exam dates, et cetera. Um, the library, they arranged a subcommittee to generate content for their own respective sections. Um, but until there was training, no one actually put content on the site by themselves. And it's actually still the case today. Um, there are very few people on our campus that actually put the content on the website. And this would be a drastic change from um, what our faculty and staff are used to. Um, as mentioned before, uh, they're used to posting up their own information. Um, and while we ask them to generate this content, we would ask them, is this public information? Is this marketing? Or is this procedural? And does it belong behind the portal? Um, so we found over the next couple of months that uh, content generation and delivery would be slow. Um, and keeping it maintained still poses a challenge. Um, but as the date drew closer to August 15th, our dean had asked Karen, um, our assistant dean for student services, to help us generate content for the launch. And on August 14th, see there's Chinese food, had tie-in somewhere, um, we took over the IT department offices and the help desk and we basically pulled an all-nighter, um, which is probably not uncommon for many of the folks in here, but um, we were fueled only by Chinese food and Dunkin' Donuts coffee and we found ourselves, you know, hacking away at this site. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Donald. So I'm going to take a step back um, a couple months um, to when we first came up with the homepage design and a couple other page templates. Um, the old jumble, and, and we all assume everybody knows, but the old website was 15,000 pages, 26,000 nodes, completely unmanaged and unorganized. There were entire sections that you couldn't get to except through, uh, through Google. Um, and some of them were quite important, which was even more shocking when I took my job. Um, they, the level of content duplication where one department had posted one thing and another department had posted essentially the same thing but in different words, we had f some pages where there were six different versions that were all supposedly current. Um, so I, we called it a broom closet. I, I, on this slide, I called it a jumble. It literally was a giant maze where you couldn't navigate from one place to another. And that's not necessarily the fault of anyone in particular. Uh, the way the structure had been before, there wasn't a team. There wasn't some controlling mechanism to maintain the site. It was built, handed over by IT to the content people from every department, essentially decentralizing everything, and just said, have at it. Um, so well, obviously, we broke down that structure. Um, Originally, when I was hired, and it's actually written into my job description, uh, the idea was that we would launch a new site by summer, and then by the fall and the winter, we would start talking about putting back all the procedural stuff. There were things as simple as, um, I don't know, the checklist for faculty to get a course approved were on the public side. They were out for the world to see. Um, w using internal language, there was nothing that prevented anybody from posting anything like that. Uh, so th there was no there was no secret or there was no private information that the uh, that, that didn't show up on the website. So we very quickly broke it down into a public marketing site and a portal site, which is not uncommon or unusual, but we didn't have it. Um, very quickly, in probably about the June time frame, um, Karen joined us and we had several conversations where it became very apparent that the portal sites couldn't wait. There was the thought that the law school would just simply cease to function if they didn't have access to that information through the web. Um, we disagreed, but there was clearly some level of needed information that had to be on a portal side uh, to allow the, the law school to operate. They, they, it had gotten to the point where the registrar's office could not function without the web forms. They just didn't have, they had completely abandoned paper and PDFs and they could not function. Um, so we were trying, we, from the 15,000 pages, we had set a goal of getting down below 2,000, which is still a very large number, which I don't even think we need that many. But um, there's a lot of content because we like to bring the message that we are a dynamic, wide-ranging school, and everybody has a story to tell. Um, 
I guess I'll skip over that. Um, so I'll, the first presentation that we gave to large number of stakeholders was at a faculty meeting in May 2013. Um, and when we presented it to them, we started off not with a, a giant picture, which is what they probably would have wanted to see, but with a concept about um, what were the goals, how are we going to get there, and how is everybody going to play a part in that. So the first goal was to create a marketing tool, and there were three subparts to that, that it should be good looking, which ours was not, um, and was one of our directives from the dean. Um, it should be consistent and easy to navigate, and it should be engaging, which we, you know, my uh, teammates have, have talked to. Um, a major goal for me was making it sustainable because this is the size of our web group. So anything bigger than this big is not something we can keep up. Um, we went down the road of responsive design, which today is not a new concept at all. A year ago at UConn, it was. Uh, they were still handing out uh, Dreamweaver templates for departmental websites at that point. Um, they're now using WordPress in a very robust system, but that didn't come until after we'd already gone down our, our road and launched our website. Um, we talked about content development cycles, limiting the scope, not letting it be open-ended. Um, we've committed to a content review cycle, which um, somebody will talk about in a few minutes. And then very clear delineation of responsibilities. So on the aesthetic front, you've already seen the graphic. Um, very clean, very block-based, nothing too fancy, but, but a significant leap forward from where we were. Um, we have a very beautiful campus, I guess I'll say. Uh, it's, it's gothic buildings, very stone. All, it's, it's a very beautiful campus. It's, it's very, it looks like a monastery, because I think it was at one time, right? Seminary. Seminary. Um, so we wanted to bring that forward, because it clearly was not coming forward from our old website. So there's a lot of space for images in, in the new site. Um, so then we went down the road of talking about making it consistent. The first four, three months, at least three months, there was very little actual content development. It was all structural design. We went back and we broke down all the menus, all the pages to zero um, and said, what, what is it that the school needs to communicate? How does that fall into categories? Uh, what are our drop-down menus going to look like? And we eventually went with no drop-down menus for the same reasons that other presentations have talked about today. Um, and then we started talking about the sustainability of it and page templates all before we even touched any of the Drupal code. It, not, nothing had actually been done at that point. Um, so back to the goals, um, make it sustainable. So we, we adopted responsive design, and I imagine most people here in, in here have a concept of responsive design, but <coughs> in the old model, you created a mobile site and a tablet site maybe, and a website, and they all had different layouts, and they were managed in different code sets. Responsive is obviously a CSS3 uh, concept where it's all the same content, just reorganized and resized for every mobile screen. We didn't have a mobile site before. The website just didn't work on mobile. It just didn't function. Um, one of the big things was limiting the scope. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to the uh, content heads and the, um, the different departments about what they actually needed and what we could act they could actually maintain. And we're still talking to them about that practically every week. Um, and there's a lot of features that we had built into this giant, really cool design that just don't exist. Um, and they may exist someday, and we may get to them. And then the real challenge was going from the Cadillac, everything's great, this would be fantastic if we had these things, and backing it down. Um, and it, it literally is just negotiation at that point about what, how can you communicate your whole message um, without all the pieces that you've laid out at the beginning. Um, from the code side, from the, the Drupal side, we tried to stay completely off the shelf uh, for the most part. We're using contrib modules. The old site had 30 custom written code modules, which were in horrible disrepair. Um, we went down to two, which is much more maintainable. Um, and everybody who knows Drupal knows that there's just pretty much everything you could ever want out there, and then you just tweak it to what you need. Um, one of the big things that came out of all of the meetings, and we had literally hundreds of meetings with different people who were bringing content to us, is that they really didn't understand the process. Um, all of the conversations started with, here's what I want to put up and tell them. Not, what is your goal? What is your message? What are you trying to communicate? They, they were already at step four, and we were back at, we're starting from scratch. Let's start over. So it's a very complex diagram up there, but it basically breaks down into six parts. Um, there's a bunch of loops and a bunch of other things in there. Um, and we, we actually show them this, but they don't necessarily follow it very much. Um, it's for us to guide them through the conversation. 
it, it starts with messaging, then you move on to what resources do you have to devote to this. Um, graphics development, even photography. We, we don't have an on-campus photographer. Bianca stands in when she can. Um, so just developing a simple page to advertise an event, they hadn't built into their budget or their thought process the ability to say, well, we need you know $1,000 for photography this year for our department. It just, there was nothing. They had no concept that that was even a responsibility that, that was, belongs to them. Um, then we talk about structure, and there was a lot of heated debate about I belong on this menu, I should be at the top. Um, I don't think I fit under that category. Um, once we worked through all that, then it's the content. And we finally converted a very large number of our, our staff and faculty to the concept that content is not a simple process. You actually have to go think about it and, and go develop it. Um, there's an editorial review process now that's run by communications, and then we publish it. Um, there, again, are still very few people who actually have published rights on the site. Uh, just to maintain that control because we don't want to devolve into what we had before. Um, and then we've committed to a content review process um, that somebody else will cover. Um, so basically I made it this small and then we started talking about, well, wouldn't it be nice if this page had embedded video? Wouldn't it be nice if this page could have embedded pictures? But nobody has to know any HTML or CSS to do it. Um, and you can do that with a content management system. There's a WYSIWYG, there's, but it doesn't always work the way you want. So we act I actually took it a step back and said, um, I'm going to build sub-content types. And um, we call it the sub-paragraph system. It's, it's just built on a field collection module. Um, this is the one technical thing I'll throw in here. Um, essentially, you just add a content type, and then there's an add button if you've ever used field collection. And then we built a whole bunch of sub-module field collection pieces. Um, they're all pre-coded. You just pick, you want the image on the left, you want the image on the right, you want paragraph above, below, you want to embed. It, I think we're up to 12 now, at least. I don't know, you guys use it most of the time. We're, we're up to a lot. Um, and, and there's no, there's no, nobody ever looks at any code. They just, and nobody has to really understand how to use the WYSIWYG even. They just pick the type, upload the image, type the paragraph, it's done. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this page actually consists of eight subparagraph types. Um, it's a single content type, and there are multiple pieces, and the page is actually assembled by Drupal, which is fantastic. Um, and at any time, you can sort them, reorganize them, um, which is great for like facts and that kind of stuff. Um, you can add another one at will. Um, and these are just a few of the examples. We have embedded quotes. We, have, we designed several different modules. Um, the newest one that we just rolled out is like a fact call out with a nice little embedded graphic thing, um, which I can show in a minute. Um, all without really, with no coding. It's all based in just Drupal modules, all point and click. So even the building of it didn't involve what I was actually hired to do. It's, it's maintainable by pretty much anyone at this point who has an understanding uh, and has the documentation to understand how it's put together. And then the end users who do most of the content upload, um, it's point and click. They just pick their type, push the button, up it goes. So th th this was the breaking of the rule because it got a little more complex to build this than we were going forward on the scope front, but um, it, it's been well worth it. And, and we're hoping to be able to bring in more people into the public, or at least the content entry role, um, because we've simplified the user interface so that they can't create content that's not attractive and presentable. Um, content review cycles, we've committed to no less than an annual review of all content. So that involves dragging in the content heads or bringing them in nicely. Um, and having them literally go through every page that they're responsible for on an annual basis. Um, seems like common sense. It doesn't happen automatically. Um, and then one of the big things that we've, we've somewhat struggled with but that we're trying to stick to is the division of responsibilities. Um, there are certain things that we're all responsible for so that there's no overlap, there's no redundancy in the sense that we don't duplicate each other's work. There's, no, there's two people aren't going to be working on the same thing at the same time without knowing it. Um, and we're managing it through simple shared mailboxes and Google Drives and that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is that we've spent a lot of time working with um, content heads to sort of walk them through the process. They have most, some of them have their JDs, most of the professors do, most of the staff actually have some advanced degree, but no one has an eye for seeing it from the outside perspective or a marketing bent or even an information architecture bent. They, don't, they can't organize the information 
easily in a sense that it would go on the web. Um, and so we actually spend a lot of time having discussions with the faculty and with the staff about how their content is going to be perceived, how it fits into the global picture, and how the voice can be maintained and consistent. Um, this is you. Content? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk um, about content. And I just want to go back and just uh, make a comment about uh, some of the things Don just talked about. So that whole thing about scope and programming and all of that, um, I'm happy to say I understood about that much. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, our jobs are to do the communications marketing piece and to build content that sells the school. So we have focused on that. And Don has built uh, things in the background that allow us to manage that very easily. The idea was that at some point we would have the content heads or designees from the content heads also do content development, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so under the content development headline, the who, what, when, where, why um, is a conversation that we're always having. We have it among ourselves as a global site and what we're trying to accomplish. And then we have that conversation with content heads. Um, we're not quite there yet with editorial standards, and that was a huge problem on the last site. Um, all different voices, all different uh, ways to present information. Navigation was a second factor on top of that. It was near impossible to read. So we're still managing that quite closely with the idea that at some point, once we have a high level of trust with other content heads to put in their own copy, then we'll be able to open that up and basically anyone can use it. Um, so the big question always has been for me, how the heck are we going to do this? Because as um, I think just mentioned, all those slots on that home page need to be filled with content. And although we're not a news site and have to update the content every day or every hour or every minute, we have to update it with some sort of frequency. Um, so in addition to the web project, um, Bianca does all our social media, she does some photography, she does all of our video from concept to execution to posting. I'm the editor of the Graduate Magazine, which comes out twice a year, it's usually about 56 pages, do media relations, do all of our marketing, um, print. Um, electronic versions, e uh, email push, all of that. So how are we going to fit all of this in? So every time we did a page design, I, I, I would say to these guys, "How you're killing me. I'm, I'm up nights thinking about how I'm going to fill in the slots. So we came up with some methods in order for us to be able to stay on top of that. The content heads is a big piece. We don't write their copy. They know their business far better than I will. So we, we walk them through, we get them to give us something, and then we can start that dialogue. Just to underscore what Don said, we often had, I want this picture with this paragraph. And then they went, we said, no, 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 come on back. And sometimes it would take multiple visits for them to be able to hone in on what they were trying to say. What do they have that we want to tell people about? And that's a whole different skill set for a lot of the folks who run the programs. A lot of the folks don't have a marketing orientation. So we'd say to them, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to get? What's your message? And that was a new word for a lot of people. So we took a lot of time with that, and we continue to take a lot of time. Editing, 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 all the time for consistency. Um, we went back and forth at one point about a phone number. How do we put a phone number on the website? Should it be area code dot, the rest of the number? Should it be a dash? Should it be parenthesis? We had a whole conversation around this with one of our faculty members. And at one point, we finally said, enough. We're using the AP style guide. That's going to guide us for the entire site. So we're going to be consistent. We're going to be consistent about how do we refer to ourselves. We're going to be consistent about how we present certain words that are unique to our programs. So we had to have those conversations over and over and over again. Um, content creation has been a challenge. And I put creation in quotes because there's some information that we create um, specifically for the website. But in many cases, we repurpose. We repurpose information that we create for other platforms. So as I mentioned, I'm the editor of the Graduate Magazine. I'm doing a story in the magazine. I'm pulling it forward to the website. And we have a bunch of different slots where we can do that. If I'm writing a press release, I'm making that a story and pulling it forward to the, to the website. So a lot of repurposing. Um, another thing we've talked a lot about, um, and we've just started to wade into this water, is getting um, a mixture of bylines, asking our students to write story, stories for us, asking our graduates to write story, stories for us, and giving them bylines. They like to see their name on the website. And it shows that they're invested in the community, invested in the institution. So we've been uh, going down that road as well. <coughs> And reprinting, I mentioned that um, a minute ago. So who is the audience? Karen. So one of the, uh, is this OK? Is this mic on? Yes. Um, failed joke. 
Um, so who is the audience? And one of the things that, that's been consistent throughout, I think, all of our, our um, discussions is that the old site had um, no rhyme or reason as to who the audience was. Um, for every single member of the community, everyone thought they were the office, uh, the audience. Their particular, um, uh, their particular office was the folks we should pay attention to. And so it really felt like that cantina in the Star Wars, right? Everyone had a particular um, reason why they thought that current students were the audience, uh, faculty were the audience, staff were the audience, alumni were the audience. Um, what about all those prospective faculty members? Shouldn't they be the real audience? And what about those current students? So we had no clue who we were talking to, which meant that any, miss any mission that we had as an institution, anything that we held dear and valuable for us um, to go forward was lost in, um, in, in all these pages that content heads were able to create. And so one of the things that we needed to really decide um, as, a, as a team was who, who was that audience? Um, and the audience, it was clear, is that we needed to have a clear marketing perspective on the site. We needed people to come to the website and understand what we did, what our goals were, what our strengths were. Um, and so having that first piece, um, be, have, be clear on that first piece, um, why are you here, what do we do well, and why you should matriculate, um, why you should apply, why you should matriculate if you're a current student, um, was a really important piece. So looking at that marketing perspective was key for us in terms of delineating that, that website into our marketing side. Um, but then what we found was that in all of the morass of our website, with all the content heads, me included, um, we just kept creating these pages, as Don mentioned. So I recall very clearly creating pages that went, I, th I thought I saved it, it went somewhere. Um, so it was broken in some tree and Don probably found all of them. Um, but we had this really muddled website that didn't work for the messaging. A lot of our users, whether they were our staff or our faculty, students, everyone had to Google um, what they were looking for to find it on our website, which, is pretty, which was pretty sad. Um, and so um, one of the things that ended up happening is that um, that closet we're all supposed to keep all the dirty laundry and all the, all the brooms hidden, um, we didn't do that. You know, what was in our closet was pretty visible. No one could find anything on our website. Um, and when they did find it, it was, they found three, four, six different versions of the same document. It was confusing. It was not um, ordered in any way. And so instead of hiding the closet, we actually showed all the dirty laundry. Um, and it was very clear that we had a mess. Um, we had content heads and offices who were creating forms without any regard as to the systems that they had in place, whether those systems were PeopleSoft, um, ACES2 on the admission side, Simplicity on the career planning side. Instead of using those systems to create, to collect data, they were using forms that were, by the way, collecting personally identifiable information um, and were routed and forwarded to many different offices without any regard to FERPA or confidentiality. So there was a lot of problems with the way we were doing business. Um, and it was clear that many offices used the website as their primary source for, having, uh, for doing that business, sometimes even with a person within their office. So we wanted to make sure that we um, cleaned up this mess and, and, and it was ordered. Um, and so in redesign, we really needed to have a way of making sure that we had not only the, the marketing side, but we also had the side that said, okay, now that you're here, how do you really do business? Um, I love the Big Bang Theory, so this is the, um, the friendship logarithm from Dr. Sheldon Cooper. And if only all the offices sort of took an approach like this to how they did business, it would, ma it would have made this whole process of content development a little easier. Um, when we approached folks, and as Jess said, in June, um, up against a Jul of a August deadline, it was really tight to get to take the four of them away from all of the other things, the technical side, um, the marketing piece, getting the marketing side up. It was really hard um, to herd the cats. Um, and so I came in to try to help herd the cats. Um, it was a long time before they got herded. Um, but I think we did a great job trying to explain to them with the, the design and the, um, the model that, that Don put up earlier um, so that people could understand what value their offices had um, to the institution, number one. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to people how their material actually had a marketing value for the institution. 
So for instance, our business office was um, notorious for saying things like, you will not get your money if you don't, it was very negative, you know, you're not going to get your money. You're not going to get residency. You're not going to get the class you want. So we came at it as a very negative approach. So talking to them through the, the positive spin that, you know, we want everyone to become a Connecticut resident. As a public institution, you save almost half of your tuition. As an out-of-state student, you'll get essentially a $25,000 scholarship for coming your second year and becoming a resident. So we take that approach. We love you to have um, become Connecticut residents and save $25,000. Um, here's the process. Um, so we tried to really convince people that there was some value to prospective students um, and to the public and looking at our institution and seeing our institution as, as some place that they'd want to be and a community that they would want to be part of. Um, and so once we got over that hump, we moved to, okay, so how are you doing business? How are you collecting information? What forms do you need? Um, and in that, a lot of people struggled with that public versus portal side. Um, in that they realize that, um, okay, I'll, I can understand how I need to clean up my language and become more positive and less negative and really draw people into our institution, um, but they forgot that integral piece of, oh yes, but I need that form. So right before, when we went live, the registrar's office literally did shut down because they did not tell us that they needed these forms um, in order to do business and in order to register students or proceed with ad drop. I mean, we went live the 15th of August a week later, we had, we had classes. Um, so that was a very unfortunate timing in lots of ways, but also um, you know, took a lot of cajoling and a lot of conversations with, with countless people about um, how they do, um, how they conduct business. Um, and one of the unintended consequences of, of all of this was that we really forced some policy changes institutionally. We cleaned up a lot of um, troubling situations around collecting personally identifiable information, um, possible violations of FERPA, um, a total standard um, practice, standard practices had been changed, um, which was throughout this process. So that was a really nice piece for us. Um, and I, I really just see myself as, you know, sort of the, the fifth wheel on this, <laughs> on this team, but um, it's been awesome. And so, because I can't help myself, um, <laughs> You know, it does feel like we're superheroes, right? We're sitting in our web meetings every week um, talking about all the issues and looking at the website and looking at um, all the analytics that we have. We, I think we've done a really good job bringing it all together. Um, and so even though we're underappreciated and unrecognized and people barely listen to us and they're going to really hate us when we go back to them and say, by the way, you have to edit everything again, um, I still think we're superheroes. Karen and I even went with the matching purple and black outfits to prove that we really are superheroes. Wonder Twins, actually. Um, so once we figured out that we had these two separate websites, and one was obviously going to be a portal where people could do forms and do all the daily types of things they need to do, register for a class, find a template, all that kind of stuff, um, what it really came down to was that a website is designed for messaging. And uh, as Karen had mentioned, we had to go through and figure out who is our audience. Um, and what we came down to is that the primary audience for any law school is probably prospective students. Obviously, we all are here to educate students, and so the whole and most important thing is to get them to actually come to your school. So the primary message that we wanted to work with in everything that we did was, come to UConn Law. This is where you want to come learn. Um, and a few of the, the points that we wanted to make sure that were expressed throughout the website not just on the home page, um, obviously all the things that most law schools are probably doing similar messages. You know, we, we offer a top-notch education. Uh, we're truly affordable. UConn has a very low um, debt ratio when you graduate. Our faculty members are experts. Uh, we offer a really supportive environment. And obviously, no matter what you're interested in, you can do it here. And so how do you express that message through a website without using those exact words? Um, and so a lot of what we did was come up with different areas where you can express this information. Um, and I know it looks really small on here, but this uh, sort of bottom right is an example of our monthly calendar. We made sure that, uh, as long as we know about it, every student event, uh, every student group that's having an event, if admissions is having an open house, if uh, the library is having a tech education session, anything like that gets put in our website. Um, and so that's sort of where the messaging side and the portal come across because anybody can go into the portal 
and they can put in a calendar request and that gets sent to the members of the web team and then we actually put it on the messaging side. Um, and Don built in a really great feature where we can actually select some of the pages that these display on. So if it's a student organization meeting, um, it can display on the student life and resources section. If it's an admissions open house, it displays uh, also on the admissions section. We have different columns on those pages and so we also can have specific calendars. Um, and then this information for is a section of our home page and that is where you can find out sort of more the portal side of things. If you're a new student um, or admitted student, where do you go to get that information? And so a lot of what we wanted to show was that we are really robust. We have all these things and when you're here you're supported. Um, but these were messages that we wanted to make sure were expressed throughout every portion of the website, not just on the home page. Obviously message two, our faculty are really important. Um, we have many audiences for this message. We have the prospective students. We have faculty at other schools who are looking for somebody maybe to collaborate with. Um, obviously there's always that bothersome US news ranking and faculty rank other faculty. So this is an important message as well. And Michelle had shown you earlier what one of our faculty profiles, or two of them, looked like on the old site. Uh, and this is one of our newer ones. So they all have a similar structure to them. There's a, a photo. Um, I think we finally convinced all of our faculty to let us use a photo. A couple were a little resistant to the idea. Um, everyone gets a bio that was actually written by a hired freelance writer so that they all are written in a similar tone, all have a similar length. The faculty obviously got input and final edits, but we maintained the overall type uh, of messaging that was in there. They get to pick their representative works. There's a CV. Uh, all the contact information is the same once we finally decided how we were going to display a phone number. Everybody's phone number got to put up there. Um, and so the idea was to show, you know, the really robust things that our faculty are doing um, and offer a couple different messages. You know, maybe you want to come teach at UConn. Look at the people that we have teaching here. Do you want to work with one of these people? Can you supplement what we have? Um, are you looking for somebody to research with from a different school? All that information, everything that you need. Um, is in there. And I put this all into message three, but really there are a lot of messages. We have current students, we have other people, but some of the major things that we needed to think about, no matter what we were doing, uh, what the content was, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's rankings. We don't like them, but we can't ignore them. And so that was kind of uh, something that we needed to make sure. You know, some of the types of things that get considered in rankings, are those being clearly, clearly expressed throughout our website? Um, we are a state school, so we have a lot of state funding and we want the state to be proud that they are supporting us. So the website needed to make sure that that message came across in everything that we did. Um, and then our alumni, you know, they're not necessarily part of the immediate community, but that's what we're putting out into the world. And we need to make sure that not only are our alumni proud of the school, but that they're represented on the site. And we worked with uh, our alumni and exter external relations office um, and we have a whole section of alumni profiles. Um, there's information, uh, there's uh, profiles, but then also information about graduate gatherings, reunion, things like that. We have a community engagement section where we talk about some of our clinics and some of the things that we're doing to give back to the state. So content heads is a term that's come up a lot today. Um, and I kind of like to think of them as our former president saying, the buck stops here. So what does it really mean to be a content head? Um, in the development process, they were the ones responsible for large sections of the website. And if they wanted to designate other people to work on uh, smaller portions underneath that, that was up to them. And what we did was say, you need to look at all of this old information that you have, no matter where it is, if you can find it on the old website, you need to look at it and determine, does this still need to exist? Um, and if it does, what is the purpose of it and how does it fit into your global message? So if you are the academic dean, talk about the different courses that we have underneath. Talk about advising programs, all these kind of things. How do they fit in and how do they uh, go into the structure of the entire website and individually how do they all go underneath each other? Um, it was an interesting process to work with content heads, I think, on the development side. Um, as Dawn, I think, had noted earlier, it was a lot of just, I want this because I do. And our job uh, as sort of the overarching people who saw the whole website was to say, you know, how does this fit in globally? What is the purpose? And that was what we kept having to come back to and ask, what is the purpose? 
And so now, moving forward, um, content heads are, devel are developing new sections of the website. Um, it's their job to make sure that everything is constantly updated. We do have a one-year review cycle, but sometimes things need to be changed. Um, you know, if there's a, a deadline that shifts for some reason for admissions, or if uh, you know a course has dropped, obviously things like that. We need to change. It's up to the content heads. In addition, everyone always has an opinion, right? You have a whole school full of faculty, students, staff members, everyone has an opinion. And maybe somebody who works in the library has an opinion about what something on the student organization page should say. And they'll come to us because we're the web team and we can say, you know what? Great idea. You should go to Karen because she's the content head for student life and resources and tell her. Um, and so we've created a funnel system so that we as the web team are not being inundated with constant requests and being the ones who have to make those final decisions. It's the content heads who have to vet that uh, or go back and say, maybe, but I need a better developed idea. And then the content head comes to us. Um, so that way we're not creating a structure where everybody is constantly having to be, not that we don't want to listen to them, but it's a much, uh, much more streamlined way of getting that information to us. And so some of the things, you know, we launched on August 15th, but that doesn't mean that everything that we ever needed was on that website on August 15th. So these are three of the sections that we've done just in recent time. Uh, we had a winter term this year, so we had to develop uh, branding for the winter term. What are the courses? We had to work with the registrar's office and the, the academic dean to figure out, um, you know, what are the courses that are being offered? What's the language that we want to say? Who is this offered to? Um, and so all that kind of stuff eventually landed on a page, but we had to work with a couple different people in order to develop that. Uh, we just had reunion. Obviously, reunion happens every year, but um, it had already passed by the time we launched the website last year, so this was the first time it was part of our site. Again, work with the Alumni Relations Office. Commencement, also a yearly thing. Um, this was the first time it came up, and so these are constant sections that are in development and that are going to be rotating. And we have more. Um, we have a clinics and experiential learning section of our website, but we have a new dean who's in charge of these things and wants to redo it and do it a little bit differently. So we've been working with him, bring him in, give him the global vision of how the site works, explain to him what we just explained to all of the other content heads, and it's his task to go back, re-envision what he wants it to look like, and come forward to us. Um, we're building an international section to talk about all of our international programs, um, all of the different international courses about our exchange programs, a whole variety of different things, um, professors that are really skilled in international law, all of that's going into one section. Again, we have a designated content head for that who's in charge of coming to us with all the different ideas and working on that development. And then who knows what else? There's always something that pops up. And so the idea is that we meet every week and we talk about any new ideas or anything that's come up in that week that we all need to work on. So it's a constantly evolving process. Just because it launched doesn't mean it's done. And I think Don's going to talk a bit more about that. I'll try to wrap it up just a little bit. Um, so uh, again, I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about the launch. And I'll do it relatively quickly because we're running out of time. Um, we hit June 1st. And these numbers are somewhat made up. But that's basically where we were. Um, and there was a lot to be done, <laughs> a lot to be done. Um, the library website was actually the, the shining point at that point. Uh, it had been pretty much built, but everything else was still in discussion. Most of the content heads um, meetings, that, the multiple meetings with them occurred between May and August. Um, so basically, I have very little memory of, most of us have very little memory of, of anywhere between June and August 15th. Um, and, and the amount of sleep we each got is probably about that big. Um, so that, that led to that last night, which people have already mentioned, which is there was something like 30 something hours that we had all been up straight in a row, which got literally a little bit ridiculous at the end. Um, and there, was, there should be somewhere, there should be a picture if there isn't of me sleeping on a couch in the staff lounge. Um, but in that night, we actually launched a new library website, the new live website, the two portals, um, and took down the old stuff roughly between 3 and 5 AM. The best part was that at 2 AM, I was still writing code to make some of the stuff work. So um, the fact that it actually works and that we had the highest number of page views that we've even to till today 
on the 15th and 16th, um, because essentially all of our faculty and staff went through and looked at every page that we had put up. Um, and, the, and the server didn't go down and, and nothing bad happened and people were generally happy. Uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, it, it, as everybody's mentioned, and as you all know, all the websites are continuously evolving. The content updates are constant. Um, we all have full-time positions and responsibilities that don't necessarily include this, necessarily. Um, so there's, there's always this, this, we have a weekly meeting which we've all committed to, um, and it actually keeps things going. We have, going to have at least every meeting. Um, every meeting this summer is booked with, with content heads to keep them up to date and to move stuff forward. Um, there are entire sections that we had built into the original model that aren't even there, which we continue to work on. Um, we actually spent some time uh, since the launch developing a homepage 2.0 with a bunch of focus groups with students, uh, redesigning it slightly, not too much of a thematic change, but sort of targeting the content that's going to be there and that's being pulled forward from the other sections to feedback we've received from students and, and the admissions office and that kind of thing. Um, I've talked about all the rest of these things. The, the biggest challenge that we've had um, was the immediate shift from the way we did business in the old system to the new one. Um, so we've actually held trainings, we've held informational sessions to try to get the faculty and the staff to understand the new structure and to use it correctly. Um, we still today, unfortunately, have people who say, what's the portal? How do I get there? Um, but that's actually decreased significantly recently, which is really nice. They're actually using it now. Um, the page hits on that side are going up. In fact, at the moment, and it's mostly probably due to grades coming out and that kind of stuff, but our highest visited link on the home page is the student portal, um, which could say two things. I think, I think the admission cycle is pretty much over and it's all grades, but um, the students are using it too. And I actually was in a uh, focus group where one of the students said, um, I didn't know that existed, but now I do. My life will be so much easier. Um, so that, that's always good to hear. Um, and, and the meetings are going to continue. This is going to go on essentially forever, whether each of us is here or not. Um, we've sort of built in the model that the only way this is sustainable without additional help is if the people that are in these positions uh, continue to maintain this. Thank you. Hopefully we haven't bored anybody. I know you mentioned you used the brand book for certain things. When it came to questions of aesthetics, who is the final arbiter of decision maker? All of us. <laughs> okay. Do you want to talk to that? Uh, are you talking specifically about photography and graphics or just the general? Well, you know, the, the anything site? from like fonts to, you know, because there's certain people that communities have stronger opinions about that than others. Yes. Um, Hold on, I'm supposed to use this. Um, so, yes, people have opinions. Um, and in fact, we had um, someone come to us for a meeting about content at one point and told us we had made a stupid design, uh, design decision about the font that we chose. But, so, <laughs> quote. quote, that's really stupid. Um, but we decide, Don would make recommendations um, in addition to what the university standards were around branding. And so there are some places where we have no leeway and some places where we do have leeway and where we did, he would bring something forward and we would discuss it and debate it and, and you know, make some decisions that we understood to be a global site decision. This wasn't going to be done in pieces. It was a global decision if we made them typically. But all of it ended up here. Um, in terms of the graphics and the photography, um, Bianca does all the photography on the site essentially. Um, and between the two of us, we put together graphics either ourselves or with designers. So one of the things that, well, that's much louder, allowed this to work is um, the interim dean who basically formed this group uh, basically gave us full authority. It was a clean slate. Make it better. I don't care how. You have, you can do whatever makes it better. Um, and, and there's obviously some restriction on that, but there's, we've enjoyed and, and it's worked the idea that we are the top tier and obviously with guidance from the administration to set the direction of the school, but we're the top tier for the, for the web. I just want to make another comment about that too, which is um, we ended up with sort of the perfect storm of uh, staff changes, um, leadership changes, um, because again, when I arrived, there was that divide between IT and communications. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of leadership support for making changes to the website. It just never bubbled up to the top of the list. 
Um, it happened that we had um, a dean leave, we had an interim dean, we had a search that was going to commence, and we had a new provost. And everybody started looking at the website and said, this is really bad.